Good evening. Great to see everyone here this evening. Good crowd out on this damp night. Uh, we're glad to have everyone here. We, uh, as you all know, our brother Rick Duggan and his wife Janet with us this weekend and through Tuesday night. Um, we had a good lesson last night. Look forward to the, the same this evening and for being together and worshiping God this evening. We'll uh, be meeting every night at 7 p.m. Other than Sunday, we'll do our regular classes Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, so everybody be aware of that. Um, we are streaming the services to some of our shut-ins, but we are not making those public. That may not be exactly the right terminology or whatever, but at the conclusion of the, of the, uh, of the week or Tuesday, then we'll have those posted, so if you want those, uh, they'll be out there. But uh, uh, we are just trying to get those to those of our members that we know that are not able to be out. Speaking of them, let's remember them. We're not going to take time now to go through that long list, but let's remember those that are struggling with that. Um, I guess we might add that if you didn't see that uh, we have a few that are uh, normally with us that are out because of sickness, the Stricklands, um, Ron, uh, Wilkins uh, was evidently dehydrated and been to the hospital, but I think he's doing better now, and the cars are uh, under the weather a little bit and with him. Also, uh, Jacob Keyes is with us this evening. He's been in Texas. I learned South Texas, which is a long ways from here, um, and going to be here until maybe Monday or Tuesday and then driving back down to help with his grandfather there. So let's remember him as he would be traveling. It's good to see him. Um, also, if you'll remember here a while back, we put out an email about uh, um, uh, helping if you wanted individuals to contribute, and Justin and Travis collected some funds from, every, from some people to help with the building of their demolished uh, assembly place, and so those funds have arrived, and Travis reported that Rody will be sending us a report with uh, that um, for individuals to know what's going on, and he'll post those later. This evening, our uh, song leader will be Stephen Russell. Michael Valens will have the opening prayer, and Jonathan Haynes will have our closing prayer. Uh, any other things, uh, men, that need to be announced before we enter into worship? If not, well, let's prepare our minds, and we'll turn it over to Stephen. first song this evening will be <clears throat> The Lord is My Light. No so do me do The Lord is my light and my salvation Whom shall I fear and he is my strength, the defense of my life. Whom shall I fear? Have mercy, O Lord, and answer my cry. Your way, 
I will not despair. Your goodness sustains me. Teach me your way to dwell in his house all the days of my life. This shall I seek and all oh, to Behold the Lord in his beauty, this shall I seek. Wait, wait, oh wait on the Lord, be strong and take courage, wait on the Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, giving you thanks and praise, sending to you, dear Father, our, our love. We think about you and the way that you have taught us, dear Father, to um, what real patience truly is and how you've waited on us. Please help us, dear Father, tonight as we open another portion of your, from your word and hear Mr. Duggan speak about waiting on the Lord. Please help us, dear Father, tonight as we um, come before you to have our hearts open and, and our uh, minds attentive to your will. And help us, dear Father, to always love you more than anything in this world. Please continue to bless those, dear Father, that are among us that have suffered illness and are having difficult moments. Help them to get through it. Help them to recover, if it be your will. And we continue to give you honor and praise for the many blessings that you shower upon us every day. Please continue to love us. Please continue to give us all that we need. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lesson, we will sing, uh, Teach Me, Lord, to Wait. No, me don't so. Teach me, Lord, to wait down on my knees, telling your own good time. You answer my pleas. Teach me not to rely on what I. To wait in prayer for an answer from you. Teach me, Lord, to wait while hearts are aflame. Let me humble my pride and call on your name. Keep my faith eyes on thee. Let me be on this earth what you want me to be. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like shall walk and not pain. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to
I knew that would happen, but I didn't know which night or how many. I would like to make a request. Could we just keep on singing? Last night and tonight, we have been terrifically edified by not only the selection, but by the enthusiasm with which you have sung these songs, and they're very moving, and I appreciate that very much. I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 15. A couple of years ago, I had a doctor's appointment, and I went to the office as I usually did, and the doctor's office was wall-to-wall people. I've never seen so many people in one place in a doctor's office in my life. Janet and I sat there. I sat and I read and I talked to her and I looked around and I kept expecting someone to get up with a a sign that said, set the captives free. But nothing like that occurred. Finally, I got back to see the doctor and he was as frustrated as everybody else waiting for all those hours to get in. The receptionist had made a mistake and had overbooked. And consequently, he wasn't in a very good mood, and it was the shortest exam I've had, and that part was okay. But when we talk about waiting, it can oftentimes be a very negative thing. If you're waiting in traffic, if you're waiting in an office somewhere to get something done, if you're waiting on the phone, those aren't very pleasant activities. I would like for us to examine this evening what the Bible says on this subject, as much as time will allow. And we call this, of course, Teach Me, Lord, to Wait, just as we have sung. And I would suggest three things about this idea of waiting for God. It first of all refers to an activity under command. A soldier has certain duties that are set aside for him to perform. They may be like others, they may be different, they may overlap. But it's activity under someone's orders. He has to do those things. That's very similar to us and God. Second, there is a readiness for any new command that may come. This same soldier we've just referenced may be waiting for orders to come in and he doesn't know if he's going to be shipped out or what, but in the meantime, he keeps doing what he's doing until he gets those new orders. Now, you might say, well, we don't have that application made to us because God has no new orders. Yes and no. All the scriptures are there. They're, They're not going to be added to. They're complete. But I may have orders when I change relationships that I didn't have before. If I'm a single man and I become married, I have orders to observe now I didn't before I was married. If I become a father, I have more orders. If I become a deacon or an elder, I have yet more orders, and so on it goes. And the one who prepares himself in the orders as a Christian and does so properly, if he is blessed with more duty, he will find that he has more commands coming his way. And then the third thing we see is that it's the ability to do nothing until the command is given. If I'm uh, 20 years old, I'm not going to start acting like an elder. I don't have that command. And a soldier, if he knows what's good for him, will not take upon himself to begin acting like a captain if he's still a private. And so we understand the need to be very, very diligent to know exactly what our orders at any given time will be. When a person comes to your table and he's a waiter, he may stand there very patiently for five minutes and you're having trouble making up your mind and he he finally says, well, I've had it with you guys. You're not going to make up your mind. I'm going to make it up for you. Here's what you're going to get and I'll be back with your order in a little while. What would you do? Would that be acceptable to you? I really doubt it because a waiter is one who waits while you give him the orders and it may go on an absurdly long time but it doesn't mean he has the right to do it for you. Now when we look at this we have four categories that I'd like to talk to you about this evening. I'm not saying this is all the categories but it's all we'll have time for. The first one is wait on God in obedience and here's where Genesis 15 comes into play. Genesis 12, God has called Abraham to go to the land of Canaan. He is there. And he comes to him in this chapter and he says in verse 1, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Abraham, Abram at this point, uncharacteristically of him, I believe, comes out with some 
attitudes here that we haven't really seen before. Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. It was a common practice according to the Newsy tablets and the area around which they lived, the laws they had for a person who had no heirs to let his chief servant become his heir. He said, I don't, I don't have an offspring of my own. You promised it, but I'd say close to 10 years have passed. And I still don't have a child to call my own. And we're getting older and older. And so Abraham is a little edgy, it appears. I hope I'm misreading that. But in verse 3, then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. That's what the law that he lived under said. So this word came to him. In verse 4, from the Lord. This one shall not be your heir. Eliezer is not the one in whom the promise is going to be fulfilled. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Well, that doesn't mention Sarah. And she may capitalize on that. But it just mentions it be from his own body. That's what he had said. And in verse 5, he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Psalm 147, 4 says, he counts the number of the stars and calls them all by name. Imagine. All we can do is say there are multitudes and more multitudes multiplied by many more multitudes. That's all we can do. But God calls them all by name. Now, he says, so will your descendants be. He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. God, it seems to me, uses a huge visual aid. We, we have visual aids, but nothing compared to what God can use. Look up at the sky. Maybe 8,500 stars they could see at any given night. And he looks up at those stars and said, those stars should remind you. Every time he would look up after this point, he's going to see those stars, that visual aid. And his point that he makes is, so shall your descendants be like those stars. So he starts out by saying, I don't even have an heir to God saying, look what you're going to have. You maintain that faith and that will be yours. Now, that's Genesis 15. He didn't enjoy waiting any more than we do. I get that impression from this chapter. In chapter 16, Sarah has her turn. In verse 1, Sarah, Sarai, Abram's wife, had born him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So she said to Abram, See, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I may obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Two things here. She too is tired of waiting. She too has waited some ten years. And no child has come. And now she's even older than she was years ago when the promise was given. So... She's diagnosing and treating herself and concluding there's no way I'm going to have a child. That's probably not even what God meant. In fact, probably what he meant was take this handmaid and it'll be Abraham's the father and I'll call that my child. Abraham heeded her voice. Verse 3 says they had dwelt about 10 years in the land of Canaan. He went into Hagar, she conceived, and her mistress became despised in her eyes. She could do what her mistress Sarah could not do. And there was some tension. And Sarah's reaction here is one of the ugliest for a good woman. She had a major fail. In verse 5, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. She's the first one to reap the bitter fruits of her plan. And it's all Abraham's fault. And so you'll notice, as you get down to this, the child is born. Chapter 17, you have the account where the covenant sign of circumcision is given. Finally, in chapter 21, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. The Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him, called his name Isaac. That means laughter. The, almost the, the yuck, as if the yuck is on Isaac for, or on Abraham for not believing and uh, Sarah for not believing that 
they would be made to laugh. And they make a play on that word in verse 6. God has made me laugh. And all who hear will Isaac or laugh with me. And so you have this situation where it was not all laughter that was for Isaac. You have this now 13-year-old boy, Ishmael, who's been replaced. And he is making fun. He is scoffing, verse 9 says, at the time when uh, Isaac was weaned. And it's actually um, not a very pretty picture that's being painted here. But we're told that Sarah wanted him out of the picture. And so Abraham has contrived in a human way to do what he thought would satisfy his wife, get a child, and answer the fulfillment of God's plan when in fact it's been an abysmal failure and a heartbreak to everybody. A heartbreak to everyone. And the result of it is then the joy is marred by the tension of this child in this family that is divided. One's going to have to be sent away while one remains behind. And I would just suggest to you that Abraham had to learn how to wait. I believe one of the greatest and hardest lessons we have to learn is the ability to wait instead of taking matters into our own hands. You'll see various occasions of this. In Ruth, for example, Ruth chapter 1, you'll see the occasion where Naomi comes back to the promised land after some 10-year absence and She's without her husband and without her sons. They're dead. When they come to her, and they want to know what's going on, and they call her Naomi in verse 20. She said, do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. You can't imagine such a change in a person to go from pleasant to bitter. Why is she this way? Again, it's the Lord who bears the blame. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. I don't think it was the Lord's idea that they even go to Moab. However that may be, he's not the one to blame for their problems. But here's the interesting thing. Learning how to wait can be one of the greatest blessings in our lives. Look at what happens. She kisses her daughters-in-law before going back. One leaves. Ruth says, I'll go with you wherever you go. Wherever you stay, I'll stay. I'm going to stay with you. Wherever you go, I will go. 16. These things spoken by a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law have become so precious in our culture that we use it at weddings to describe the love of a bride for her husband. That's how precious this has become. Your people should be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. What a blessing this was. Naomi has lost so much. But she's gained in one woman more than she ever could have imagined. This woman, Ruth, was a worker. The kind of work she engages in to support her mother-in-law is back-breaking, hot, laborious, and hurting. She's a servant. She has a servant mentality. Her desire is to help her mother-in-law. This is one who is a protector of her mother-in-law. She's thoughtful. She's kind to her. She listens to her. She takes her advice. By the time you get to chapter 4, this woman, Naomi, who said, call me Mara because I am so bitter. The Lord has made me bitter. Has found Boaz and Ruth producing a child Verse 13, she bore a son. Verse 14, the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. Look what the Lord has done for you, Naomi. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Better to you than seven sons. They can see it. I believe now Naomi does too. Naomi took the child, laid him on her bosom, and became a nurse to him. I would suggest to you, in order to learn to wait, we must open our eyes and see what God has given us. Ruth is right in front of her. 
But all she can see is her loss and not the blessings. In 1 Samuel 13, quickly, we'll note that Saul, King Saul, the first king, had a major problem with waiting. And he shows it more than once. In chapter 13, the Philistines are on the move. They're ready to destroy Israel, apparently. In verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, and the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and pits. They have a king, but they still need a God. And they don't see him working in this. In verse 7, some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. They don't even want to be in the same territory as the Philistines. They've run. They've escaped. And then in verse 7, as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. So he looks at this situation. Now this looks dire. Because the Philistines are numbered in verse 5 as some 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand on the seashore in multitude. You ever tried to count the sand on the seashore? This is quite a few people. Saul is scared out of his mind. Verse 8 says, he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. That circumstance is going to be his decision point. Not what God has told him to do. Not what the prophet has told him to do. Samuel. But what he thinks he ought to do. So he said, bring a burnt offering. He offered the burnt offering. And it's vain to think you can sacrifice to God against the will of God. That's in vain from start to finish. And as soon as he finished, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him as if all were well. He was a good talker. But he's violated the principal command of God. And that is believe in him, wait on him for his will to be done. People say, I'd rather go to hell for doing too much than too little. I've never seen much value in that mindset. Why do you care? You're in hell either way. And furthermore, he took matters into his own hands. How many times have you seen people act presumptively? They act not because the scriptures tell them to do this, but because we're in a bad situation. They panic. We better do something. And they lose all focus on God and they forget to wait on God. The common views are it's better to do something than to do nothing. Also, going somewhere is better than sitting still. If you're in a traffic jam, do you say, well, I'll take the first turn off and just go any direction as long as I'm moving. That's not the best way to get where you want to go. In Isaiah chapter 40, we have sung this this evening. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You have three metaphors one of which overcomes a natural impossibility. There's no way we can actually mount up with wings like eagles, but that's the effect of what God does for us. And the second one, a natural weakness, they shall run, but they're not going to be weary. You run long enough, you're going to get weary. These are not going to be weary. And then third, you have a steady progress. They walk and they don't faint. Many were the times in the Civil War People would walk and walk and walk till some of the men fell out fainting. He said, these are going to walk and they're never going to faint. What does all this say? That those who wait upon the Lord are going to be blessed beyond their fondest dreams. Waiting. Waiting is what he promises us. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Four things I see in this, in this passage. First of all, there's teaching. Psalm 6, beautiful psalm, puts it this way to us. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chase me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. He sounds like these people we've been studying. This is Abraham and Sarah. Here's uh, Ruth and Naomi, especially Naomi. Here's Saul. You're troubled people. This psalmist, David, is very troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, and then he breaks off. He doesn't finish it and says, 
How long? How long? But then, verse 6, I'm weary with, weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. Have you ever cried so much you thought your bed would float away? I drench my couch with my tears. My eye wastes away because of, its, uh, because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. Why is he saying they should depart? Not because of something in David, but because he's prayed to the Lord. He's waited on the Lord to act. And as a result, all my enemies are now going to be ashamed and they're going to turn back and be ashamed suddenly. David had been taught to wait upon the Lord. All those years running from Saul have taught him some major lessons. The second thing, there's timing. We live in an instant society. We want it five minutes ago. We don't want to wait. Our society militates against waiting. We can't be like society. Third, there's trust. In 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul speaks on this with reference to his great suffering he was going through. It's called a thorn in the flesh. I don't know what the thorn was, but he said in verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure... By the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Then he says, I take pleasure in infirmities. And reproaches, and needs, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. He says, Lord, heal me. Lord, heal me. Lord, heal me. Three times the answer's no, no, no. And then after this, he says, then my grace is sufficient for you. I've given you everything you need, Paul. You can deal with this thorn. You need this thorn. And Paul says, that's all I needed to hear. He doesn't say, is there another God up there somewhere? I thought this was a God I could trust. Those words never even formulated in Paul's mind. He's willing to wait with the thorn. And then he's promised that the result of this is going to be a blessing and growth to him. And those with whom he's associated. I'll take pleasure in these things that most people don't take pleasure in. In Psalm 73, you see the same thing with Asaph. Here's a man who says, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. I was envious of the boastful. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he talks about them. In verse 11, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. They don't wait for anything. Everything just falls in their lap. They have it made. Everything is good. And he said in verse 15, if I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your people. I would have influenced people the wrong way. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. I couldn't even bear to think about what's going on. These people have it made. But then, in verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. You put them in slippery places. And he goes on to describe how I wouldn't trade places with them for anything. He finally learned the lesson of waiting on God. And then there is the tenacity that has to be a part of our makeup. We don't give up. God doesn't act on our timing. God's timing is impeccable. He's never been late. We have a way, I believe, when disaster or hard times hit a society, we have a way of judging God. I'm not saying you do, but many people in America do. Why, if God is a good God, does He let this disease come in and kill all these people? Why does He let all these people suffer and have to be shut in their homes, many having mental issues, many having job issues, many starving doesn't God love us anymore and that's exactly what this tenacity is speaking of Psalm 92 speaks in this regard I was on the phone to a man about six months ago right in the middle of the beginning of the COVID 
And as he got through, we were talking about some things. And he said, um, I hope you have a, a long, happy, and boring year. And I couldn't help but laugh. Boring can be very good, can it? Boring can be very good. But what if it's not boring? Can we believe that God is still God? Can we believe that God loves us above our ability to comprehend? Can we believe that God always acts in our best interest? And can we believe that we will look back someday and see that in spite of all the difficulties we may have gone through, we were still blessed beyond measure. I believe that's the case. So with that in mind, you notice the apostles in Acts 1. When Jesus gives his final words before his ascension, a few days before his ascension, He's talking to these apostles of his who weren't exactly exemplary disciples during his earthly ministry, but now they've, they've learned some things. They were progressing. And we're told in verses 4 and 5, you're not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They couldn't just do something. People have the statement, don't just stand there, do something, right? God is saying here, don't just do something, you stand there. If you're in the emergency room with someone who has some symptoms the doctor can't figure out, you don't say, well, just do something, do you? That may be the wrong thing. You could kill somebody. And God is saying to these men, you stand there, you wait. And when the Spirit comes, He will use you in ways that you never could have imagined. And you will be a blessing to others. And many will be saved. Good things, we're told, come to those who wait. In Matthew 17, verse 9, Tell the vision to no one till the Son of Man is risen from the dead. They apparently succeeded in that. Now they have this waiting to do. And whenever the Lord wants us to wait, we can do it. That's obedience. Second, wait on God in faith. Our ability to wait exposes our level of trust. Do we really trust the Lord? In Exodus 14, there's the occasion when the children of Israel are told, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. The Egyptian army is closing in and they're told, don't run. Stand there and look. Do they have enough faith in God to stand and look? They did this time. Three days later, they don't trust Him again. But in the book of Jonah, in chapter 4, in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah has been displeased exceedingly. He's been very embarrassed, all that he's gone through. He doesn't want Assyria to hear the prophecy that may make them change. He wants them destroyed. So in chapter 4, he's very angry. He prayed to the Lord, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? These people have all turned to God. That chapter 3 is a marvelous chapter about the power of God on a heathen nation. They've all turned to you. Now you can't destroy them. I told you so. As though he knows more than God. You know, people who don't wait on God, but try to get ahead of God, think they're above God. So he sat down just to see what he would do. You have the right to be angry, Jonah? Oh, I'm so angry I could die, and yes, I have the right. It's better for me to die than live. Well, you know what happened. The worm destroyed the plant that was giving him some shade. And he again said, it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah waited. Watching the city, waiting. But with an attitude that is 180 degrees against God. He wants every one of them to fail, to fall, to be destroyed. On the other hand, Luke 19 shows us a scene where the Savior comes to the brow of the city of Jerusalem. And he stands there and he looks at this place. And he weeps. He weeps over the destruction that is coming to the city. He knows their sin. 
He knows the punishment that is headed their way. And he knows the suffering that's going to be theirs. And he weeps because it's going to happen. Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9 shows that God rewards those who wait. Ananias is told to go see Saul of Tarsus. He can't see. He's met Jesus on the road. He needs to become a Christian. I don't know but what this preacher Ananias has known various ones who have been killed at the hand of this very man. I don't doubt but what he's afraid of him himself. He may think all this is a trick. But does he think it tricked the Lord? Does he think the Lord doesn't know about all this? Did the Lord not see him helping them stone Stephen? Well, certainly he did. But what Ananias does is say, Lord, I've heard a lot of things about this man. He starts informing him. By the time he gets through, the Lord says, okay, now, now to go to him like I told you. Patiently listened. No major rebuke. Just sent him on his way. I suggest to you, waiting in faith means just what it says. The skeptics have assaulted our faith for years. It started with Celsus in the third century in a major degree. And it's continued on till this very day. You can't turn on various channels without seeing some attack on the Bible eventually showing up. In the 17 and 1800s, the Tübingen School in Germany was known for their attacks on Scripture. F.C. Bauer and his Tübingen School of heretics and unbelievers said many things. They said, for example, John and Acts weren't even written until A.D. 160. Well, if that's the case, then what we have here is not only a flawed book, but a, a great lie. And the consequences of that is it cannot be the Word of God. Of course, that's a pre-archaeological position. Everybody knows today that can't be. They found copies of John about around 125 or so A.D. in Asia Minor, written but found in Egypt. So here's the case where it's uh, existing years before it actually existed according to the Tübingen scope. Others said, well, we'll wait. We'll wait and see what the evidence provides. And when they waited, they saw that the scriptures are exactly what they claim to be. Uh, William Ramsey and others demonstrated that very forcefully. The persecution can cause a person to waver in his faith. Are we willing to stand if persecution comes? A lot of folks in our society are very concerned about disease. A lot of Christians in our society are very concerned about persecution. Is persecution going to come our way? I believe it has all along to a certain degree. Is it going to be much greater? Perhaps so. I don't have a crystal ball to say that. I would be amiss to say one way or another. But it would not surprise me at all. And it seems to me the cogs are already being put into motion for that. And the question we have then, if persecution comes, will we wait on God to rectify this? Or to get us out of it? Or to let us be rewarded by means of it? That's a question we're going to have to ask ourselves and determine what's it going to be for us. I'm impressed by the fact that in 1 Samuel 24, Persecution prepared David. He was persecuted for a very minimum of 10 years, probably 13 or so. When it came his time to deal with Absalom, his own son, he was well prepared for that. In Ephesians 6, three times the expression is given, therefore, stand. Stand. Stand in the evil day. Having done all to stand. As one fellow pointed out, it's not standing unless you stand where the battle is. If you can stand where the battle is, then you are actually standing. Standing is the opposite of surrendering. If you take a stand, it means you haven't given in to the enemy's demands. It's not running away. It's not yielding. And when you see Paul in his last epistle in 2 Timothy, he says, bring it on. Let them kill me. Remember what he had written in Philippians 1? To depart and to be with Christ is very far better. A superlative of a superlative. It's very far better. I would rather depart and be with Christ than anything this world can give me anyway. But to stay in the flesh is more needful for you. And now he's at his final imprisonment and they're ready to execute him. You don't see him wringing his hands. You don't see him crying. You see him feeling sorry. 
for those Christians such as Demas who didn't stand at this point. And he seemed very sorry for those of his persecutors who haven't accepted and embraced Christ as he hoped they would. I suggest to you, 1 Timothy 5, verses 24 and 25. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. God knows his own. We don't always know. Can we wait on God in faith? I'll tell you what I saw once. A good friend of mine had a farm. And he had sheep. And he had some dogs. I think they were Australian healers, but don't quote me on that. One of them was blind. It was a congenital problem. Sort of a macular degeneration in dogs. And this dog was blind. He gave orders to this dog that was blind... He could tell him by signals of the mouth to go forward, to go back, to go left, or to go right, stop, whatever. And that dog would do exactly what he pointed out to him to do in his, in his noises. And I saw that dog going back and forth, herding those sheep, stopping, going around and getting one, trying to get away. All this, not seeing any of it, guiding them through the little fence so they could be locked in their pasture because that dog had such faith in his master, he believed in things he could not even see. And if I understand these passages that we've just seen, that's what God is asking us to do. We don't see God. But do we have the faith to see the unseeable? And then there's the weight on God in pain. This is a great test. When things start to hurt us, that's when the rubber meets the road, isn't it? Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. In England, a number of years ago, someone imported larch trees from southern Europe, and the man who first received them put them in his hothouse, thinking that if they come from southern Europe, they must need warm weather. Well, they were dying daily. He finally got to the point where he thought they're, they're useless. He threw them out into the dung heap where it was very cold. And next thing you know, they started to thrive. These large trees need cold. But contrary to what you would think, they need cold to be strong. Psalm 119 says, we need pain. We need pain to grow the way we should. And there are a variety of, of pains. But Hebrews 10 puts it like this, verse 32, But recall the former days, in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Now let's just let that savor in our mind for a moment. You young converts, out of the Jewish religion, into the doctrine of our Lord, went through a terrible time. You not only suffered the loss of your goods, but even physical persecution. Reproaches, tribulations, and the plundering of your goods. What's he saying? You endured all this. You took it gladly. You rejoiced at it. Can we rejoice? When people persecute us, these brethren did. Now they're on the verge at this point of falling away. And he's writing five major apostasy warnings in the Hebrew epistle to try to keep that from happening. This is one of them. But we learn and we grow in pain. Pain teaches us lessons that we cannot learn in any other place. Someone said this. We can rest contentedly in our sins and in our stupidities. And everyone who has watched gluttons shoveling down the most exquisite foods as if they did not know what they were eating will admit that we can ignore even pleasure. But pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. C.S. Lewis. That's exactly right. That's the whole New Testament. 
When I was a boy, in front of our house, this farmhouse, there was a, a dog named Frankie that belonged to a fellow down the road from us. One night, he didn't get out of the road fast enough and a car hit him right in front of our house. A lot of the skin on his side was just ripped off, hanging. And he was lying there in obvious agony. And any time we walked up to him trying to get near him to help him, he snapped at us. Not knowing that we were his best friends at this moment. We wanted to help him. But all he could do was say, I'm in pain and I'll snap anything that gets near me. I won't take any more of this. Fast forward. Number of years. We had three children. I remember vividly the times we would go to the doctor with those children. Nurse would come in and at the very side of that nurse, especially our daughter, the son's pretty much, but especially the daughter, they would break a high jump record, jumping up on Janet, grabbing her by the neck, twisting their feet around her, screaming into her, usually her left ear, as if to say, how can you let this sadistic woman inflict this pain on my body? Didn't understand. But notice the differences in the reactions. What did the dog do when it was hurt? It snapped. What did the child do? It held on tighter. I'd like to suggest to you that's what we need to do. Good things come from pain. It leads to self-examination. Luke 13, verses 2 and 3, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He calls these people to a state of introspection. Look inside yourself. These people who have been killed, people that Pilate had killed, are the people who stood in the next two verses under the tower and it happened to fall on them, those 18. Are they the most wicked people on earth who just happen to be all together at the same time? That's ludicrous. Bad things can happen to good people. Don't ever assume that if a tragedy occurs to someone, he must be a terrible person. These are not the worst sinners, and yet they perished. All of us are going to perish eventually. Death is a part of life. Furthermore, it sets an encouraging example for others. Paul speaks of this in Philippians 1 when he says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard. He's chained to these soldiers. A captured audience. He can preach to them all the while they're with him. To them and to all the rest, that my chains are in Christ. They know I'm innocent. In fact, I'm here because of doing good, not bad. And 14, most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Look at the example he set and how it helped others who had been timid before his arrival. If Paul can do it, we can do it. And then it increases our faith. 1 Peter 1.6, every chapter of 1 Peter discusses suffering in some sort. Persecution. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, get this, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You greatly rejoice. Why greatly rejoice? We're going to be persecuted. That means to be overjoyed, to rejoice exceedingly. If gold could talk, the gold ore, and it's being put into the fire, what would it say? Get me out of here. What happens when the fire has finished its work and the dross has been burned off? The fire is now pure. It's purified the gold. The fire has purified the gold. The fire that Peter speaks of here purifies the child of God. Number four, and this is the last, wait on the Lord to come. He tests our patience. 
If you want to turn with me to Romans 8, a most magnificent chapter that I'll never fully comprehend this side of eternity. Hopefully, then, yes. But Romans 8, he talks about the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. He talks about sufferings quite often. But it can't compare to the end. Don't look at the middle of the game when everybody is bruised and bleeding. Look at the end of the game when the victory is won. So that in verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That word earnest expectation is a triple compound. It comes from a word and the first of it that means away from. And the second part of it is the head. And then the third part of it is the expectation or the look. It's kind of like saying that a man is stretched up on his tiptoes with his neck raised out looking to see how far he has to look to see whatever is bringing in some treasure he dearly wants. It may be a, a son returning home from overseas. It could be a, a wife who's been away. But he's stretched out, stretching that neck. Phillips, in his paraphrase, said creation is on tiptoe. He can't wait to see this great, this great blessing that God is going to reveal when this life on earth is over. You see this at an airport oftentimes. A military family is waiting on the loved one to come home. Maybe he's been gone for a year. And you'll see them, they're looking, they're looking, they're looking, they're stretching, they're moving around. And if you were to go up and try to talk them to them and engage them in a common conversation at that time, they'd say, I'm sorry right now, I'm a little bit pissy. All their focus is on that one who's coming. And that's what he's saying here to us with reference to Christ. We're going home. And so he says there's a revelation of the sons of God. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So there's the full disclosure. All of creation waits for this new model. This body will no longer have its problems but be a glorious body like that of Christ himself. Matthew thirteen forty three: The righteous shall shine as the sun. The dark days of earth mean nothing anymore. Here's an eternity of joy. An eternity of worshiping our Savior. And giving our thanks. There's the redemption of the body. Verse 23. Not only that but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves. Eagerly waiting for the adoption. The redemption of our body. This is resurrection when this corruptible has put on incorruption and then there's the realization of our hope verses 24 and 25 for if we were saved in this hope we were saved in this hope but hope that is seen is not hope for why does one still hope for what he sees but if we hope for what we do not see we eagerly wait for it with perseverance listen to that we're not in heaven yet that's the sweet by and by. This is the nasty here and now. He's saying if we wait through this nasty here and now, faithfully in our service to our Lord, look what anticipates us. We eagerly wait with perseverance. Hope requires the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. Patience, endurance, fortitude, steadfastness, perseverance. That's the definition. If you want a short definition, it means we're going home. And it's far better than anything we can comprehend. Now in James 5, we're, we're winding down. I give you my word, we're winding down. In verses 7 and 8, Therefore be patient, brethren, till the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Here's the coming of the Lord. Farmer buys seed and fertilizer in anticipation of a great harvest. Farmer told me a few years ago, he said, instead of planting my crop this past year, he said, I wish I had just gone and dug a hole and poured $25,000 in it and covered it up. It would have been a whole lot less work. And the next year was about the same. But eventually it balances out. 
So James apparently knew about this patience like a farmer. And that's what this verse is speaking of in verse 7. And so he says in verse 8, You also be patient. You be like that farmer. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's only a heartbeat away, as a matter of fact, in one perspective. Be patient like a farmer. And then be patient with your brothers. It's very easy during hard times to take our anxieties, our cares, our problems, our contentions out on those who don't deserve it. Our brethren are helpers. We should be helpers to them. In verse 9, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned, because the judge is standing at the door. Jesus knows. Our brothers are on our side, and we're all on the Lord's side. And then be patient like the prophets. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. How could Jeremiah preach for more than 40 years? With fewer converts, and you can count with the numbers of one hand, uh, numbers of fingers on one hand, and get, keep going and remain faithful. Never change his message, always do what God said. How can you account for that? This is what verse 10 is speaking of. They're an example of suffering and steadfast endurance. And then be patient like Job. In verse 11, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Job lost his possessions. He lost his children. In one way, he lost his wife. He's tortured by disease. He goes through the misrepresentations of his friends. He's abandoned by those who once respected him. I don't know of anybody that I've ever known who's gone through what Job went through. But through it all, he clings tenaciously to God. So that verse 11 here is telling us we need to read Job pretty often. And James, it talks about him because in the end, the purpose of the Lord is how God dealt with him in the end. And Job was blessed exceedingly. Pain will make us bitter. If you look at Job's wife, curse God and die. What if Job had said that? One afternoon I was driving on a road in Murfreesboro a few years ago called Church Street. And I went four miles and 50 minutes. Not exactly a speed record. I could have crawled and gone faster than that. But I realized that if I got off that road, it would be even worse somewhere else. And so I stayed with this road and finally made it to the destination. You may sometimes feel that you're on a road just like that. Things slow down in hard times. And you think, when are we ever going to get through this? When will the end ever get here? We've slowed down to a a snail's pace. The fact is, as we sing in the song, Near to the Heart of God, Hold us who wait before thee. Near to the Heart of God. In Isaiah 40 again, in verse 31, Wait on the Lord, renew our strength, Mount up with wings like eagles so that we can run and not be weary so that we can walk and not faint. And as in Galatians 6, 9, in due season, we shall reap if we don't faint, if we don't give up. May God bless us all to that end. Thank you for your excellent attention. If anyone needs to obey the gospel this evening, if we can assist you in any way, won't you please let that be known. Repent and be baptized if you need or be restored to the Lord. All together we stand and sing. We invite. the glory of His cross. Firm as His throne is promised stands, and He can well secure what I've committed to His hand till the decisive hour. There So
Again, we're thankful to see each one of you here, thankful for the efforts of Rick. Those are uh, tenets and truths that uh, I cannot be reminded of enough, and I never tire of hearing, and I appreciate so much the, uh, the thought put into the lesson this evening. Are there any announcements any of the men have before we're dismissed? If not, we'll hope to be back here tomorrow at 7 p.m. And uh, then we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer by Brother Haynes. Let it bow. Our most righteous and glorious heaven Father, Lord, we praise and glorify your great and holy name. Lord, and indeed, on this earth it can be Nothing but fast pace, temptations, and distractions that we face here. Lord, please let us have patience. Lord, as your apostle has written to us, help us count it all joy that when we fall into trials, that as our faith is being tested, Lord, Help it to produce patience in us, that we may be complete and perfect, Lord, that we may profit in your kingdom. Help us to wait in our roles that you have set before us as husbands and fathers, as children, Lord. Help us to all fulfill the roles and to glorify your name. Lord, may we take the talents that you have given us. May we use it and bring it back to you for score. Lord, may this be our motto throughout our lives and throughout the rest of this week, that we would serve you and no other. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>